Th thank you very much for the invitation to have me uh, over here and talk. Um, all right, so I'm going to be talking about uh, black holes um, in general relativity. And in particular, uh, what we've learned about uh, black holes in the last few years using numerical simulations. Um, so I'll start and give an overview of general relativity and black holes in general relativity because I su suspect that they're not not everyone here is an expert and just to get us all on this. Is, is this okay? Can people hear me here? Or? Okay, I'll, so I'll, I'll stand with you. Okay, so what? So the, the theme of my talk is I want to first explain to you like why I think black holes are such an interesting aspect of the field equations of general relativity, such interesting solutions, and why still today and for the next you know, 5, 10, 15 years, I think they're going to be driving a lot of the uh, developments in gravitational wave astronomy uh, and fundamental physics. So there, there's still a lot of interesting uh, research to be done in classical general relativity by studying black holes. Um, so I want to first just apologize. In, in my abstract, I said I was going to talk about three topics, uh, black hole mergers and gravitational waves, um, the, the relationship between black holes and other physics, and then black hole formation at the LHC. So I think I've got too much material here. And if, time's, if there's time to leave, I'm pretty sure there won't be. Um, but if, if anyone is interested in this topic of black hole formation at the LHC, I don't get to it. Please come and ask me afterwards I can talk about it. Uh, okay, so, in any case, there's, there's the two main themes that I want to, to give across is that the next you know, few, next decade will be a very interesting um, of time in science. One, through looking at the universe in gravitational waves. And then the other aspect where, where black holes are starting to play a, a surprising role these days in the connection between black holes and other physics. So we think of Einstein's theory is a theory of gravity. So black holes should be gravitational objects. They should be things that um, know about gravity. Okay, is that is that better? Okay, so uh, so we sort of think of black holes as being gravitational objects, uh, but there's been a lot of recent studies that. In some sense, they seem to know much more about physics than just gravity. Um, and here I'm going to show an example where they seem to know about hydrodynamics, maybe at Stokes. Okay, so let me start with uh, giving you an overview of general relativity. Uh, so, general relativity is Einstein's theory about the nature of space and time. We just call it space time. Um, so, general relativity, you can think of it as an extension of his theory of special relativity, which is also a theory of the nature of space and time. Or you can think of it in terms of gravitational theories as essentially or space-time without the effects of gravity. And so, you know, some of the, the, the interesting consequences of special relativity is nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. The speed of light is a universal constant. In other words, it doesn't matter how fast you're going relative to some measurement device that measures your speed, you'll always see the speed of light as being this number C, this universal constant, 300,000 uh, kilometers per second. Um, another interesting consequence of special relativity is this famous relationship that I'm sure everyone has seen, and it relates mass to energy. And in particular, if you have a certain amount of rest mass, it says that that's really equivalent to energy using this relationship, E equals MC squared. And you'll see that this plays quite an uh, important role in a lot of uh, things that I'll be saying about this, this general relativity. So one of the motivations for Einstein for extending the special theory to the, the general theory is, is he essentially immediately realized if, if this is really an important uh, consequence of nature, that nothing can travel in the speed of, faster than the speed of light, he realized that Newton's theory of gravity was inconsistent with this. In the sense that Newton's theory says that every particle in the universe has this universal 1 over r squared attraction for every other particle. And if you move one particle at some point in the universe, instantaneously everything else in the universe feels the, the effect of that change. And that's inconsistent with this notion that nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So the, the difference between special and general relativity, they're both theories about the nature of space and time. But in special relativity, the, 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 the geometric structure of space-time is passive. It's static. It's given. Um, whereas in general relativity, it becomes a dynamical object. It's something that 
um, not only do we interact with the experience, but we and matter energy can actually influence. And in particular, what the Einstein field equations say is they say how, given some amount of matter energy in the space time, I mean, matter and energy is the same thing in relativity, equals mc squared. So, given some amount of matter and energy, that matter energy curves space time. Uh, now, if you, you, if you supplement that and you say, okay, that's how matter energy causes space time to be curved, but how do we, as, say, small objects that don't have much matter energy relative to big objects like the Earth, say, for instance, how do we, how do we live in the space time? How do we experience space time? And you supplement that with the geodesic hypothesis, which says that the, the natural path that the object will take through space time is essentially between two points, uh, it takes the shortest distance, essentially between two points that pull geodesically. So interestingly, if you take these two descriptions of space-time, so there's, there's, a, there's a field equation that says how energy curves space-time, and this hypothesis, how you, how you interact with the curved space-time, then you don't need a force of gravity at all. That by itself can account for what we experience with Newtonian gravity. And so for example, just let's take the Earth and us as an example again. The Earth is very, very massive. It's got a lot of energy, so it's curving space-time by quite a bit. Um, and us as sort of much less massive objects, so in some sense we're little test particles following geodesics in the Earth's curved geometry, the natural path that we want to take is to fall and move radially down towards the center of the Earth. So actually what we sort of more usually think of as a force of gravity isn't really gravity, it's other electrostatic forces, for instance you're sitting in your chair as I'm standing here, that are preventing us from following this natural path through space-time. And that's why also if you go skydiving and you free fall, you feel weightless, you don't feel any forces, because that's the natural path that you want to take through space time. Okay, so now let's say we don't have a force of gravity anymore, we have a theory of space time, but it's equivalent to gravity. But now we can sort of ask, um, so in this Newtonian way of, of presenting the question, okay, energy curve space time. So let's look at the simplest distribution of energy at point particles. And what is the, the gravitational field or the space-time that this produces? Of course, in, in Newton's theory, it's this, this universal force law. It's proportional to the product of the masses. So there's a force that you'd experience that satisfies this law. So it's one over the distance squared. Um, in Einstein's theory, if you ask that question, well, what is, this, what is the space-time that a point mass produces? And the answer is a black hole. So let me now to, to try to describe a little bit about what a black hole is. And what I'm going to do is sort of take somewhat of an historical route to how people uh, came up with this understanding of a black hole. And actually, this is not something that, as I so on the previous slide, I said it's sort of a simple answer. It's actually a simple solution. And here, this first black hole solution called the Schwarzschild solution was discovered just one year after Einstein published his field equations. Um, so it didn't take very long for Schwarzschild to find this solution. But it's really taken many decades for people to really appreciate and understand what the solution represents. Um, in particular, a lot of what I'm going to say about black holes now, Einstein didn't understand. He didn't even actually believe that black holes are physical. It took you know, many, many decades for us to come up with this um, interpretation of what the solution represents. So, so the Schwarzschild solution again. It's a it's a solution describing the space time. What we now understand of as a non-rotating black hole. It's got a single parameter which we can identify with a mass, and we can relate that to something called the Schwarzschild radius, which is essentially the event horizon of this black hole. So what, a, what I'm sure you've all heard the, 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 the popular description of a black hole is essentially it's got an event horizon. Once you cross the event horizon, you can't escape. So in this sort of space-time picture, the event horizon is a causal boundary. Um, where if you're outside, you can cause the effects on what happens inside, but once you're inside, you cause the disconnection from the interior, exterior. And this, this particular Schwarzschild radius, which is linearly proportional to the mass, is the boundary of this, uh, of this black hole. That's what we call the event horizon. Um, but this also sort of tells you, like, let, let's imagine you wanted to create a black hole. How dense do we have to make it? How close to this point particle approximation do we have to get that to form a black hole? And so, for example, with the sun, the sun has a radius of about a million kilometers. If you squeeze it down to a radius of three kilometers to form a black hole, for the Earth, you have to compress it down to a radius of a century. So, for ordinary matter, you have to get extreme densities to form black holes. 
Now, in some sense, the, like you know, sort of what we really understand about the structure of black holes really came about in the 60s and 70s. So that's sort of, there was a real revolution in, in our understanding of the field equations and the solution. And it's been dubbed by some as the golden age of black hole physics. Um, so let me just give you a few of the, the milestones of what, what, what people learned about black holes given that time. So say it was only a year after Einstein published the field equations that Schwarzschild came up with his non-rotating solution. But it took almost 50 years more before Lloyd Kerr came up with a, discovered the solution that describes a rotating black hole. Um, so you see, so the Schwarzschild black hole has a lot of symmetry. The rotating black hole is less symmetry, and the field equations are very complicated. They're very non-linear. So it's not. It's a very non-trivial and actually remarkable that he actually was able to find the solution. And that a solution exists in a pretty simple and little form. A few years later, Werner Israel uh, proved one of the first what we call no hair theorems for black holes. And they were extended later by people to cover all, all black holes. And essentially what it says is that well, if we have this event horizon structure, so you know, where there's a, the interior is causally disconnected from the interior, exterior, and we ask, well, what are the possible solutions to the field equations? How many, how many families of solutions are there? And we actually proved that that there really is only a two-parameter family solution vacuum. So that it's only described, it's uniquely characterized by two numbers, its mass and its angular momentum, its spin. Um, and in, in fact, when, when he first published this result, the way that he interpreted it was almost in the, the old Einstein way of thinking about these solutions, is that proved that they were unphysical. Um, because we know that real objects are very complicated. For instance, the gravitational, or the, the geometry that the Earth produces, you need infinitely many numbers to characterize it. It's got a mass, it's spinning, but we have continents and crusts, and it's, it's a very complicated structure, and that's reflected in the geometry. And so, of course, if you have this, a very, very special solution, you usually think, well, it can't be physical, it's just an artifact of some symmetry he assumed. And that's what he sort of originally thought. But the remarkable thing about black holes is that actually they're not uh, they're not special solutions and sometimes they're retractive solutions that if you say could collapse the earth down to a black hole with all of its interesting structure what would happen is it would lose all of its all of the information about that structure except these two numbers it would essentially radiate away all of this, all of the structure and you'd be left up with a perfect whole black hole and so that was supposed to be no hair theory. If you think of all the parameters you need to describe a geometry as its hair, so it loses all of its hair except two, two strands. And so again, if this is now sort of the physical description of black holes, you know, that, that's quite remarkable. It says that we have you know, a fundamental theory about space time that might describe macroscopic objects in the universe essentially exactly. Um, one of the other sort of one of the amazing uh, results that came out of this era was in, also in the 60s when Roger Penrose proved what were called the singularity theorems. Now, in, in a Schwarzschild solution or a Kerr solution, we, because we know it analytically, we know that we can actually see that there are geometric singularities inside the black holes. And this is places where in some sense space time breaks down. Um, so the infinite tidal forces and other sort of technological properties. And so again, it was thought that at the time that that's just because of the, the special symmetries assumed in these solutions. But what Penrose proved is there's, you don't need any symmetry assumptions. As soon as you get this region of gravitational collapse where you have this causal boundary, inside there will necessarily be a singularity. Um, and incidentally, all, most of this research happened before the name black hole even was invented. So it's usually attributed to John Wheeler in the late 60s who came up with the name black hole. One of the other remarkable things that was discovered in the 70s was uh, Hawking radiation. So as I mentioned a bit in the introduction, one of the, the modern themes, or one of the interesting things that people are trying to understand is the relationship between black holes and other physics. And so even in the 70s, there was some indication that black holes, in this case, knows about thermodynamics, not just gravity. Um, and so, for example, even if you just look at the, the laws of classical black hole uh, physics, so now you've got an isolated curved black hole, how does it interact with the environment? Let's say, let's throw another object in. How does it? How does its mass and its angular momentum change? And the, the way you describe the change is the phenomenological laws, which are very similar to the laws of uh, thermodynamics. There's a first law. There's a second law. For example, the second law relates the entropy to the area of the black hole, 
And there's a theorem that says that the area of black holes can only increase, so analogous to a second theorem. And people just thought at that time, you know, before Hawking came up with his result, that that was just a, an interesting curiosity. But what Hawking did was he looked at quantum fields that live in a black hole space-time, and he actually showed that when you put these quantum fields in a black hole space-time, they radiate like a thermal black body. So in some sense, the black hole really becomes a thermodynamic object. Now, because this is all, all well and good, so we have a, a theory which makes you know, pretty astonishing predictions about these objects. You might say, well, that's a completely absurd prediction. It's just you know, the mathematics of this theory. But at the same time, uh, observers were starting to see objects in the universe that defy conventional explanation, and at least were consistent with black holes. Um, but that's the, the two examples. Uh, yeah, one was in the discovery of um, this X-ray, this star that had an X-ray component called Cygnus X1. Um, so well, what was observed was so there was a, a, a giant star was observed from the spectrum. You could see it's a giant star. It had a strange X-ray component to it. But when astronomers looked at the light curves of the star, they saw that it was oscillating back and forth. Or, or from the Doppler shift, they could see that it was wobbling. And of course, if you get a Doppler shift, you can, the, the usual reason why that happens is it's in a binary system. So it's actually orbiting a companion. But the surprising thing with this, with this system was from with the Doppler motion and estimate of the distance, they could estimate the mass of this companion. And it was very massive. I think today the, the estimate of this invisible companion is about 20 times the mass of the sun, so 20 solar masses. So here was something which was incredibly massive, but it was invisible. Um, so, okay, that doesn't prove that it's a black hole, but it's consistent with it being a black hole. But the other piece of evidence about the system which is consistent with the black hole is this X ray emission. So, here's sort of an artist's depiction of actually what the system might look like. So, here's the visible star that we do see. It's orbiting the black hole, so we see the orbital motion, and some of the material from the, the stellar wind essentially is being fed onto the black hole into the secretion disk. And so as this material spirals into the black hole, it heats up, it eventually gets so hot that it starts to emit X-rays, and so it's sort of emission from materials very close to the event horizon that's producing this X-ray emission. So, so, so that was sort of one of the first indications that you know, perhaps black holes actually exist. Of course, it's not again. It's not direct evidence, but it's 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 consistent with the black hole interpretation. Um, another uh, bit of evidence that at the same time, or another strange phenomenon uh, that was discovered at the, in the early sixties called quasars, uh, quasi-stellar objects. So it was something that looked like a star, but it had a spectrum that was very different from a star. And eventually, you know, people deduced that these were actually at cosmological distances. Once they discovered that, what was so puzzling about it is how could something be visible uh, here at, at such large distances that imply that they have huge intrinsic luminosities? And again, there was no conventional the physical process that could explain how it could look that bright. Um, except when, when Donald and Ben Bell sort of used sort of the same ideas that say, what, why is this producing X rays? Um, Incidentally, he didn't call it a black hole, he called it a swash of throat that was <laughs> gobbling up matter. Um, but again, the same idea is that you've got a, a black hole, material is accreting, and as the material accretes in, it loses the potential energy that heats it up and you can produce a very bright source. But for these black holes to be as luminous as they are, they have to be a, a million, perhaps a billion times as massive as the sun. So again, it, that doesn't prove that it's a black hole, it's powering phase or to at least consistent. Okay, so, so that was uh, sort of the golden age of, uh, of, of black holes. So what, what was left to discover? Why are we so interested today? And in some sense, I don't want to demean all the work that those people have done, but in some sense, almost everything. And the reason is because Einstein's theory is that it's, it's a nonlinear theory. It's very difficult to solve the equations. And everything that had been known about the field equations and those results were, were green from a couple of special solutions, the Chris Schwarzschild and Kurt solution. Um, a few of these global properties, such as the singularity theorems, um, which tells you that there's a singularity, but it doesn't tell you what the singularity is. It doesn't give any details. And some perturbative methods, um, which, for example, suggest that gravitational waves uh, exist, which I'll talk about uh, in the next slide. So, I mean, there, there's strong circumstantial evidence also that black holes exist, but as I've perhaps hopefully 
convinced you they're such remarkable objects. I think we want you know, a similar bar of evidence um, if we say that these things really exist in the universe. There really are these very strange places in, in space, time, essentially, that exist in that universe. Um, and so, in some sense, to, to explore the dynamical aspects of the theory, well, for the most part, we need numerical simulations. So that's only something we've been doing the last uh, decade or so. But we also want to try to observe the universe in gravitational waves. In particular, if you can see black holes that collide, uh, they'll emit radiation of very, essentially, that's sort of the light, or the, or the sound that black holes make when they collide. And that's very distinctive to relativity. So that would be as close to directly seeing black holes as we can. So that, that brings up gravitational waves. So, so in, a, in a nutshell, a gravitational wave is a sort of a distortion in space-time geometry that propagates at the speed of light. Um, so in, in general relativity, as I said before, matter energy produces space-time curvature. And what produces a gravitational wave is what motion of matter energy. Um, and in particular, the denser that that amount of matter energy is and the faster that it moves, the more or the more powerful the gravitational wave. That, that you could in principle produce. And in fact, I'll, I'll show you sort of examples later with black holes, but uh, it turns out that you need tremendous amounts of energy moving very close to the speed of light to produce any kind of observable distortion. So we can't, unfortunately, produce gravitational waves on Earth in any kind of way that we can measure. So we have to look to astrophysical sources, in particular with black hole collisions, um, to try to you know, perhaps uh, see that you know, measure gravitational waves and, and actually it's just more than just seeing that they exist but then to observe the universe in gravitational waves. So let me sort of explain what, what a gravitational wave exactly does. So in, in, in the, when you're very far from the source you can describe the gravitational wave as having two polarizations. So similar to in electromagnetism the two polarizations of, of, of light. Um, and to, this sort of schematically shows the effect that it has on distances. So imagine that you have a gravitational wave that's propagating straight into the screen. So the only disturbance in space-time that it causes is orthogonal or transverse to the propagation. And it does so in one of two ways. Let's just look at the plus, the so-called plus polarization. So if you have sort of a ring of particles here and you want to see, well, what is the distance between them and how does that change as the gravitational wave passes? What this plus polarization will do is that one instant, for example, here it will squeeze distance in the horizontal direction while stretching distance in the vertical direction. And here, as time progresses, this sort of stretching and squeezing along the horizontal and vertical directions will, will oscillate. So it's sort of oscillatory stretching and squeezing of distance transverse to the direction of propagation. And the cross polarization is exactly the plus, but it's rotated by 45 degrees. So that's what a gravitational wave. Uh, does in relativity. So if we want to try to observe the gravitational waves, essentially what they're telling us is we have to build differential relays. We have to build devices that can measure differential distance along orthogonal axes. And that's exactly what all the, the current efforts are to observe the universe in gravitational waves. Um, so here I've got to the it's a slide that's showing all the various ways in which scientists are trying to observe uh, gravitational waves. Um, that's one of the most advanced, um, one of the most advanced things that we're actually constructing are the, the, the LIGO and collaborators and laser interferometers. Um, so you can see from the sort of L shape, that's the that's the axis that you want to try to measure differential distance on. And what what these interferometers are? Well, they're just laser interferometers. So there's a, a, la a source that fires a laser through a beam splitter. Uh, one one half of the beam goes one beam goes down this. This beam pipe, which is four kilometers long, another one goes down, another one four kilometers. They bounce off mirrors that are free to move in the horizontal direction. So again, if, if you imagine a gravitational wave coming straight down into the Earth over there, it's going to stretch one arm while at the same time it shrinks the other arm. And so, what this laser interferometer do, that, does is then, when the, the, the light bounces off the other mirrors, it interferes again at the source. If you see the interfer interference beam just move, you can measure the differential distance. So that's, that's basically how it works. Well, it's much, much more complicated than that, but that, that's the basic idea. Um, so this, this is expected, so it's had its initial science run, it didn't detect any gravitational waves, it wasn't sensitive enough where we expected that it should have. 
but around by 2015 to 18, they're going to be upgrading it to a level where we expect to actually see uh, sea events in the universe. Um, there were some uh, plans for a space-based mission, but in the funding situation, it's not sure exactly when these space-based interferometers will go, uh, will be launched. Um, you can also there are some other other methods of detecting gravitational waves with resonant bars or inferring their presence by measuring pulsar time or cosmic microwave background polarization. I'm not going to talk about that, but there are a few other ways in which people um, are, are looking to observe gravitational waves. So before talking about black hole mode, let me just give an overview of like all the sources that we hope to to see well, once these detectors reach their activities, where we might uh, where we would expect to see the gravitation waves. So this is a pretty busy diagram, but there are a few things that I want to point out. So on this, the vertical axis is sort of some some notion of the strength of the source. As I mentioned before, in relativity, to get a strong source, you want very compact objects moving very close to the speed of light. So you try to say, well, let, let's make an object as compact as we can. Well, as soon as you compress it down to its partial radius will collapse to form a black hole. So you can make anything more compact than a black hole in general relativity. And for binary black hole mergers, it turns out that close to the time when they merge, they're moving at the size of a fraction of the speed of light, that's 30 40% of the speed of light. So these are, we expect black hole mergers to be the strongest sources uh, of gravitational waves. So here, um, these are the ones that um, Donald and Bell are referred to as what they call the supermassive black holes that we think exist in central galaxies, so greater than a million solar masses. Um, so this is sort of a low frequency. As we go down to the stellar mass black holes, like Cygnus X1, we go to higher frequency, and it's these black holes that are in the range of, of LIGO's uh, sensitivity. So that's the legal one that LIGO's holding. Some other possible sources. Black hole neutron star mergers, or the two neutron star merge, stars merge. Pulsars might produce gravitational waves, supernova explosions. It's three mass ratio in spiral, so that's where you have a small little black hole, say, falling into a big black hole. Uh, binary neutron star and white holes in our galaxy are also possible causes. And then another thing which is quite exciting but very uncertain is on sort of turning your exotic physics uh, in the early universe. So perhaps Inflation might have produced gravitational waves, perhaps near the Big Bang. There might be cosmic strings. I mean, all of these things are theoretically very uncertain. There's no observation evidence for any of these kinds of objects. But why I want to sort of point this out is there's one interesting property of gravitational waves is once they're produced at the source, they interact very weakly with matter as they propagate through the universe. So unlike photons, for instance, they aren't scattered or absorbed by matter as they propagate through the universe. So if there was a source of gravitational waves in the early, early universe, it would essentially reach us unobstructed. So there's a potential to see backwards in time, almost near the Big Bang, if we're lucky enough that there was a source of gravitational waves. So that, that's an interesting possibility, but who knows if there was such a source. Okay, so let me, let me describe uh, black hole mode. So you describe what happens when two black holes collide. And we would break it up into three stages. Uh, the so-called in-spiral, the plunge merger would actually collide, and then the ring down. So the first, the quasi-circular stage. So imagine we have two black holes in an orbit, so at a very distant. You can use a Newtonian you know, intuition. This is just uh, like a Keplerian orbit. Um, but the interesting thing in general relativity is because of gravitational waves. So this orbital motion is producing gravitational waves. They radiate away. Gravitational waves carry energy. So energy is conserved. So as the gravitational waves are being produced, the binary has to shrink. It comes at the expense of the binding energy. And so they tell you that a binary system in relativity is unstable to the emission of gravitational waves. And that's why we expect to see black holes collapse. We expect that they in binaries out in the universe. And because of gravitational wave emission, they are they have to eventually collide. And that's this in spiral. And essentially, gravitation, and what's the one comment? Gravitational waves are very efficient at radiating away centricity, essentially. So, most of these systems, even if they start as eccentric binaries, they will circularize, and so you'll get this quasi, what's called a quasi circular in spiral. And to give you some idea of, of, the, of the frequency, the I'm just showing what the Keplerian orbital frequency is, which, to a good approximation before they collide, is the, the, the frequency in general relativity. Um, I'm showing it here in units of a solar mass, so masses in units of a solar mass, 
and separation in units of the Schwarzschild radius. So you can see when they're very, very far away, R is large, the frequency is very low, and as they spiral, and as R eventually gets to, say, when they touch, and when R is equal to the Schwarzschild radius, you say two solar mass black holes goes up to about 11 kilohertz. And that's the orbital frequency. And the gravitational wave frequency is twice the orbital frequency. Now, when they get very, very close to touching, um, then then they merge. And one interesting thing, so, so this is, we need a numerical solution of the, of the field equations to actually describe what's going on. But even before we had these solutions, we could actually guess what would happen. And the reason is from uh, Penrose's cosmic censorship conjecture. So Penrose conjectured, well, he, he proved that there were singularities inside of black holes. And then he conjectured that the only singularities that arise in relativity are always inside of black holes. They're always closed by an event horizon, so they're no naked singularities. And if you assume this conjecture, you can prove that black holes can't bifurcate. They can't fracture into little black holes. So if these two black holes collide, you assume from as an extension that the only thing that they can do is they can merge into a larger black hole. And that turns out to be what happens in this in these simulations. So this is a very sort of very Quick short stage of the of the merger. It's actually it emits a lot of energy when it does that. Um, but so, so these these black holes spiral in. They merge together, and just after they merge into a great big black hole, they're nowhere close to this curved black hole that I said all black holes when they stationary have to have to be uh, um, by the no hair theorems. And so once they they form, how they reach that 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 curved solution is in the stage called the ring down phase. And essentially what that is, so initially it's a very distorted, distorted geometry, lots of numbers needed to describe it, but they very, very quickly radiated away in gravitational waves. So some of the waves radiate away, some of them fall into the black hole. And to give you some idea of you know, how fast that happens, um, here I'm showing to you, well, first the frequency and the time constant of the least damped, what are called quasi-normal modes, so it radiates in a whole spectrum of modes called quasi-normal modes, so essentially damped sinusoids. Um, and the one which takes the longest to radiate away is this least damped mode. Here its frequency is about you know, three times the final orbital frequency in units of the, the mass. But, but notice here how small the time constant is, 20 microseconds. So for example, if you take two solar mass black holes, they collide to form a, a larger curved black hole. And you ask, well, how long do you have to wait for this thing to lose all its hair? And you know, practically within a few seconds, it will be indistinguishable from a curved black hole. So it loses its hair very, very rapidly. Okay, let me show you some examples, a couple of, an example of a simulation to demonstrate this. So this is going to be a simulation of two, merging of two initially Schwarzschild black holes, then they merge in a form of pure black hole. Um, these are three, di three dimensional plus time simulations, and what I'm showing you here is a slice through the orbital plane. Now this particular quantity is something called the labs function. We only get to the technical details of it, but it's, just a, it's a nice way of visualizing the motion of the black holes. And you can sort of think of it as, as with what these colors are showing is the relative rate at which a clock, if you're a hypothetical observer that's sitting there, how fast your clock would run relative to an observer a large distance, a distance away. So it's sort of a time dilation effect. Um, those two little black things over there those are um, called the excision surfaces, the excised regions, and they're actually a little bit inside the event horizon. So the event horizons are about 30-40% you know, larger than those black regions. And well, why we have to do that is because of the singularities that are inside black holes. We can't simulate a singularity on the computer, and so we excise a certain region of the domain that contains the singularity, and that's what those little black uh, regions are. So the event horizons are close to that, not quite bad. Um, there's one more comment before I start the animation. In the, in the Einstein field equation, there's no intrinsic scale. Uh, and so when we put when we put this binary in here, we introduce in the scale. And so the, the time units that we use, we just label as a mass of this, of this, of this black hole. But we can then scale this to any, any physical size we want. And if this, if this animation is in real time, when we start it, this would correspond to two 5,000 solar mass black holes roughly. Okay, so here I've started. You can see that they're orbiting each other. What you're not seeing here is the gravitational waves that are in the middle, but they are, and so it's losing energy. They're becoming more tightly bound. So they run away process, and then they merge into uh, a 
five, a single horizon which will link down to the curve of the In this case, they've emitted 4% of their total waste mass energy as gravitation waves. Um, but incidentally, in relativity, there's a maximum spin that a black hole can have, and we can sort of, we can come to the dimensionless number that parameterizes it between zero and one. And in this case, this, this final black hole is spinning at 7% the maximum rate. So that's the spin parameter. So you, you did, this movie is going to be a depiction of the, the gravitational waves that was emitted in that same simulation. Um, and it's this uh, sort of technical quantity called the Newman Penrose scalar, which is easy to compute, but I don't want to get into details. But um, a couple of comments. Um, one is that when you're in this dynamical strong field regime where the black holes are merging, there's no unambiguous way of defining what a gravitational wave is. It doesn't really make sense to do that. And so we can really only define you know, this plus and this cross polarized wave when you're far from the source. And so we we have to zoom out a little bit. So this is the same the same slice, but now the tail the two little black holes we zoomed out by quite a bit. You'll see the structure here. I mean that's that's what the scale is representing. But here there's no there's no interpretation of this as a gravitational wave. So we have to go to this large region or a certain distance away to see the gravitational wave. So now, when I start this, you'll see this burst of radiation. That's just an artifact of initial data. So that's what we're sort of putting as initial data. But that moves the system quickly. And now these sort of two large quadrupolar arms, that's the gravitational wave that's being produced by the motion of the two black holes there. So the, you can see that the, the wavelength is increasing, the frequency is increasing, the amplitude is increasing. There they merge, and now you see the ring down to the curved black hole. Incidentally, this is a logarithmic color scale, so because the amplitude increases quite rapidly. And so just to see the, the very early versus late uh, amplitude on the same uh, scale, I use the logarithmic plot. And actually, when you're, very, when you're far from the black hole, you, if you take this, this human penrose scale and integrate it twice, then you get the usual polarization that I mentioned, plus or the cross. And that's what I'm, what, what I'm showing you in this figure. In particular, if the, the, where I measured this, plus polarized away was exactly sort of where you're sitting, so on the axis orthogonal to the orbital plane, some distance away. Here you can see this is sort of the in spiral part of the wave. Here it merges and here it comes down. Okay, so I think that the tools of science can just sort of pretty real numbers. Again, as I mentioned, we you can scale it to any physical mass that we want. And so just to give you some idea of the, the numbers. Let's scale this example to two 10 solar dust black holes. Um, so two 10 solar masses, that's roughly how massive each one is. And the swatch radius of each black hole is 30 kilometers. When they merge, they form a curved black hole of 60 kilometers. Uh, where I measured this wave is 1,500 kilometers away from the source. And actually, in this, in this regime, so where, where this, if it were in the LIGO band, it would be the early in spiral would start so this way before the simulation, with about 200 hertz, and go up to 800 hertz. So it's actually in the audio range. That's why people say that it's much more to think, when you think of gravitational waves as sort of being the sounds that black hole make as opposed to the light. That's perhaps a better analog. So we can actually listen to the, to the sound, which I'll play you. But I'm not going to play you the, the sound from the simulation because it was way too short. Right? That's, that's all we had. And if you convert it here, this would just be a few milliseconds, and you wouldn't hear anything. So this is actually from a, a perturbative calculation of several thousand cycles before merger. And this was done by Scott Hughes at MIT. So let me play this. So this is so this is starting at very low amplitude with very low frequencies. But this is what a gravitational wave merger looks like or sounds like. That, that's the, the classic chirp signal, and you can sort of see where it comes from from the uh, you know from the, the shape of the wave. It's basically a sinusoid, um, but the amplitude is slowly increasing, the frequency is slowly increasing. But it, but it's a runaway process, and then finally when it merges, you get that pop or chirp. Okay, so as you mentioned again, just getting back to some numbers, the, the polarized the, the, the gravitational waves is also stretching and squeezing in space time. So that, that waveform that I showed you, a distance 1500 kilometers wave, 
that produced a fractional stretching and squeezing of distances by about 10, 10 to the minus 3. For example, if you, say, roughly 2 meters tall and you were there, you would get stretched and squeezed by at most 6 millimeters. Now, that, that doesn't sound too much, and that by itself would probably be fine, but the problem is this is happening at you know, several hundred hertz. And so that rapidly it would probably kill you. <laughs> Of course, if you put LIGO there, so LIGO has expansion at four kilometer long arms, so each arm would change by 12 meters, and you really don't need sophisticated made laser interferometry to measure that. But the amazing thing about LIGO is like where we might expect one of these sources. So let's say it was 10 megaparsecs away, so in the Virgo cluster. So we have to go to regions where there might be lots of galaxies, so there might be one of these sources. So 10 megaparsecs is 30,000 light years away. Um, the gravitational wave amplitude decays like one over the distance. So if one of these things did merge in Virgo, by the time it got to LIGO, this 12 meter change is now down to 5 times 10 to the minus 17 meters. Or essentially 1 20, 20th the radius of the paper. So LIGO is trying to measure a change in distance over 4 kilometers that's a fraction of the size of the nucleus of an atom. <laughs> it seems you know, completely absurd. Uh, but they're actually they're, they're there. I mean, in the initial LIGO, they got to the sensor but if there had been a merger vir in the Virgo cluster, they would have easily detected it. Um, the problem with black hole mergers are so rare, we have to go to much larger distances than 10 megaparsecs. We have to go to gigaparsecs before we can see them. And that's what advanced LIGO is doing. It's going to increase the sensitivity so we can actually reach more of the galaxies to hopefully get one of these events. The other thing that's quite remarkable about gravitational waves is how much energy they carry. Remember when I showed you this, the, the waveforms, I said that about 4% of the rest mass energy was converted to gravitational waves. So if you think about it, we get two 10 solar masses or 20 solar masses, 4% is essentially a solar mass. Um, and that, in that last four orbits and bursts, uh, which happened in a few milliseconds, essentially it took the whole sun's worth of energy equals m squared and converted into a gravitational wave. And that, that's a Tremendous luminosity, it takes calculated, it turns out to be about a hundredth of the Planck luminosity, so 10 to the 57 ergs per second in that final burst. And just to compare, for instance, the sun's luminosity is 10 to the 33 ergs per second, the luminous matter in our entire Milky Way is 10 to the 40 second. In fact, if you say, well, if you combine all the luminous matter from all the galaxies in the, in the universe at this instant, it's still less than 10 to the 57 ergs per second. So that little chirp, that little pop, and that go instant where it goes pop, it outshines all luminous matter in the universe combined. It's an energy at least. And so just curiously, well, if you actually could somehow, as this energy now, at this amplitude is passing as well on Earth, if you could actually convert it into sound rate energy, it would be about 80 decibels. So there's this, this event that happens 30,000 light years away, this pop, and it's so loud in some sense you can actually hear it here on Earth. Okay, so now I want to sort of switch to the, the second topic, to the last one I'm going to talk about, and that is higher dimensional black holes. And this is to sort of give you one example of this area where black holes seem to be not just gravitational objects, but they seem to have properties that are very much, very different from what you would usually associate with gravitational objects. And this actually occurs in higher dimensional uh, uh, geometries. And so I just wanted to sort of motivate, why, are we, why do we want to study higher dimensional gravity? And there are a few reasons, and one, one might be string theory. So string theory is arguably our best candidate theory of a you know, theory of quantum gravity. And string theory sort of unambiguously predicts that there are more than four dimensions, so 10 or 11 dimensions. And the low energy limit of string theory is Einstein gravity in these higher dimensions. So if string theory is the correct theory of quantum gravity that motivates studying gravity in higher dimensions, Einstein gravity in higher dimensions. But even if string theory is not correct, and there's been a very interesting development in the last decade in string theory, um, going to the the ADS CFT correspondence, anti lissiter space conformal field theory, sometimes called by the holographic dualities. And so even if string theory is not correct, it's sort of given us this, this very interesting mathematical tool um, which relates physics um, in a quantum conformal field theory, at least in some limit of this conjecture, a strongly coupled quantum conformal field theory to gravity in one higher dimension, in the asymptotic and to the pseudo space. And so, for example, what, what, what people have sort of started to look at with this is they've come up with models of things like superconductors, superfluidity, quark-gluon plasma, and heavy ion collisions. And these aren't exactly 
these processes, but they're models of these processes in the quantum conformal field theory, and to understand them, they use this duality to map the problem back to Einstein gravity in a higher dimensional space. Um, and what's kind of interesting and remarkable about this is that to describe all of these processes, or in most cases, you need a black hole in the civil space. So somehow you need a black hole in higher dimensions, at least with this mapping, you have to describe these processes. So I'm thinking that there's something interesting here about black holes. Well, I don't know how deep it goes, but there's something they're definitely very interesting about uh, higher dimensional black holes. And just from a geometric point of view, if you enjoy geometry, there, there are lots more interesting solutions in higher dimensions. So how is a higher dimensional black hole different from the four-dimensional curved black hole? And essentially, in all, all respects, it's, it's basically the same. Um, they have event horizons, they have singularities, they're governed by laws of quasi-static processes, by the laws of thermodynamics, they Hawking radiate, they you can form them through gravitation, collapse, etc. So all the things that we're used to. Um, there are a couple of things that are a little bit different. In particular, there's no strict uniqueness in the sense of the, the curve solution. In the sense where there are multiple solutions, um, it's not now suddenly an infinite family of solutions, but in, in, in a given particular space time, there could be several discrete families of solutions. But perhaps what's most interesting is that a lot of these black holes are actually unstable. So, for instance, in four dimensions with a curved black hole, it's, it's stable. If you, you bang it, you throw another black hole at it, you do whatever you try to disrupt it, well, it's just going to ring down back to a curved black hole. So, they're stable. And that's not the case for high dimensional black holes. Well, the, the simplest example of a higher dimensional black hole is a five dimensional black string. And what a five dimensional black string is, is you just take a four dimensional Schwarzschild solution and you add an extra straight Euclidean dimension. So you, you have sort of schematically depicted, well, let's just say, say this is our four dimensional Schwarzschild black hole. And now let's just take this space time and replicate it. You sort of extrude it into one extra dimension. Um, so you have what you have labeled by W. Um, so, so that if you just just do that, that actually satisfies the five-dimensional uh, Einstein field equations, and it's called the black string for obvious reasons. It looks like a long cylinder in this extra dimension. And I think because it's so close to a Schwarzschild black, black hole, I think it came as a big surprise when Gregory and Laplam in the early '90s actually showed that this was unstable. The horizon was unstable to perturbations in this extra dimension. So sort of schematically. Well, let's look at linear perturbations. Let's look for you know, sinusoidal modes. So let's take the metric and perturb it by some mode. We want to look at the dispersion relation, the spectrum of modes. And so this is what they found. So this is d equals four. This is the four spatial dimension. So this is a five-dimensional black string. And so you can see, so this mu here is the wave number, the one over the wave length. And so for short wave numbers, they actually find positive uh, exponential growing modes. So this shows that you start with a perturbation that's a long wavelength or a small wave number, it's going to grow exponentially. And this is the critical wave length. And this is not meters, this is the mass of the unit length of the black hole. So if it's above 14 roughly times its uh, mass of the unit length, then those modes are unstable. Okay, so this is a linear analysis. You see exponential growth. So well, what happens when it goes unstable? Um, and they, they conjecture that what it's going to do is it's going to keep that this perturbation is going to grow until eventually the, this black string is going to bifurcate into a series of five dimensional hyperspherical black holes. And they used an argument of so this is what the linear perturbation looks like, plus together with an entropic argument. So if you take this, the, the connection between thermodynamics and area seriously, uh, the black hole area must increase, and so if that's the entropy, it must increase. And the, the area of a, of a series of five-dimensional black spheres is higher than, is larger than the area of a black string of the same mass. So by an entropic argument, they, they, they argue that it's going to turn short. But the, the no bifurcation theorems that I mentioned before, if you assume cosmic censorship, they still hold in five dimensions. So if that happened, that would imply that this would violate cosmic censorship. So it was a pretty radical suggestion uh, that they made. In particular, you know, a few years later, Horowitz and Mader actually, so perhaps in quotes, proved that actually it cannot happen, but with this technical assumption. So that, so they essentially proved that the, the radius of any cross-sectional segment of a black string can shrink to zero radius in finite affine time of the generators of the horizon. So that's 
any theorem is only as good as its assumptions, and this is one of the kind of key assumptions here. Um, so affine time, it's a bit of a technical concept, but it's in some sense um, how you might label time along uh, along the horizon. If you're, you, you can't be an observer there, you have to be a photon. And that's how a photon would count time, with a sort of affine time. This is only the technical out as well. It might have to take an infinite affine time, but that might correspond to finite time as you would observe it as just as an observer. But in any case, they, they assume that that this that it, it wouldn't be natural for it to happen. And so they assume that actually something like this is what would be the end state. So in some sense, you perturb a black string, it, you get spontaneous symmetry breaking, and it evolves to sort of a wrinkly black string configuration. And so based on this, there are several people who looked for these kinds of solutions, and actually a lot of them were found, but several of them were found, but all the solutions that people found had less area than the black string. And the, no, the area can decrease is also appearing in, in five dimensions. So the, the solution that they found couldn't be the answer. Now, in the, in the last few years, some, some anecdotal evidence was gathered in favor of the Pinchhoff scenario. And this now goes back to the, the relationship of black holes and non gravitational physics. And it actually started to touch back in the, in the 80s when uh, these folks came into sort of the membrane paradigm. Where, so you take, so the field equations describe how horizons work, but you can sort of approximate that by saying, well, let's replace the horizon with a membrane with ordinary matter like properties. In particular, they show that at the linear level, um, the horizon behaves somewhat like a fluid that satisfies maybe a Stokes equations, but some very strange properties, um, certain negative viscosity coefficients, etc. Um, but then a few years ago, Cardoso and Diaz, um, so like taking these ideas for perhaps Navier or Stokes describes horizons more seriously, they looked at um, higher dimensional cylindrical flows of fluid with a surface tension and computed the linear perturbations of those long wavelength ones. And they found this dispersion relation which looks qualitatively very similar to regular flux. Um, and actually that's not a surprise at all. The only thing that they did differently was here in higher dimensions because we know what we know what this instability is. It's a Rayleigh Plateau instability. And actually, we know what it is even before Rayleigh Plateau because it's a, that this is what the Rayleigh Plateau instability is. It's something that we see every day. So you go to a faucet, you open it up, so you get a very thin stream of water. Eventually, if you let it fall long enough, it's going to beat up into spherical, the spherical beads of water. And it's the reason why is because there's instability in the cylindrical fluid. Flow. It's not for nothing to do with a faucet or the way that you sort of prepared it, it's because it's unstable. In the case of the, the relative plateau instability, it's, it's not an entropy argument, it's an energy argument. It's more energetically favorable for a fluid with surface tension to be in little beads as opposed to into a long cylindrical flow. But in any case, they sort of, sort of took a leap of faith and said, well, let's suppose that this analog between Einstein and maybe of Stokes goes beyond the linear level, and this would suggest in favor of the pinch hole, that the actually cosmic censorship would be violated in five dimensions. But of course, this is just an analog, and what we really have to do is we have to solve, solve the equations in five dimensions. So that's what um, this work with Luis Lehner, where we did this a few years ago, and perturbed the black string, and I'll show you now what happened. So this is uh, going to be a movie of a, the, something that's close to the event horizon, it's called an apparent horizon, of the black string under a perturbation. So here, both the color and the shape of the circle is going to be the radius in, in this. Any horizontal slice is essentially a swatch of that radius, which is a black string. And actually, what you'll see is it is going to tend to, so it is, it is going to be um, uh, sort of analogous to, to Rally Plateau, but in a way that's actually, perhaps in hindsight, sensible but surprising. So you can see it's going to tend to, but now you've got this thin little black string. That's unstable, and so it, it forms all this essentially this fractal like structure of you know, self similar bubbles in the approach to pinch. So, in any one instant, there's a little black string connecting the little black spheres, but these little black strings are unstable to the same instability, and so you get this sort of self similar fractal cascade uh, down to uh, where it extrapolates to zero size. So unfortunately, it stops here. You, you can't really simulate all the way through potential. Um, and the reason is that when we're solving the full field equations, 
when when these little thin segments develop, it's a small scale that we need to evolve in there. It becomes very, very expensive. In fact, this one animation took about 100,000 CPU hours to, uh, to run. So it's about a month's runtime on 128 nodes of a Linux cluster. So, but because it's sort of self-similar and we've actually been able to go through several generations, we can actually extrapolate. We can extrapolate from here, so it actually does go to zero radius. Um, now the question is, well, is, it, it's actually also consistent that it's going to take infinite affine time but doesn't have it in infinite asymptotic time. Uh, so let me show you here an animation with exactly the same thing, but now in real time. So in the previous one, it sort of slowed down so you could see what's happening at late time. But this one is now sort of what an asymptotic observer would see. Um, and I've also zoomed in a little bit so you can see the late time development of the observer. So here the, the initial perturbation is growing. Uh, so the first in the sequence the, the first big black square is forming the, the thinning black mass. So, so, so unsurprisingly, um, because just from the regular problem analysis, the time scale of the growth is proportional to um, the, the thickness of the string. So if you have a very, very thin string, it's going to grow very, very rapidly, a very short time scale. So actually, if we extrapolate when this would go to zero size in these units, it would happen at time t plus 232. So this actually does happen in finite time, even though it takes an infinite uh, affine time. So this really is going to pinch off. It's going to be sort of this fractal dust of ever smaller black holes, and you will get most singularities as they pinch off. Just one sort of final comment about the connection with the Bradley control. Um, and here's some examples of actual experiments with real fluids um, to, to study this uh, Bradley control instability. Um, and then these are actually two, two fluids with different viscosities, or relative viscosity between them. And in this bottom image, this is sort of the effect of the high viscosity case. And here with the viscosity decrease, this is the low viscosity case. And the interesting thing that happens with, with real fluids is so you get this relative to throw instability. If the viscosity is high, you do get a couple of these self-similar generations, but then it stops and they, they pinch off. And as you decrease the viscosity, you get more and more generations of this sort of self-similar behavior, more satellite formation before it stops at some finite number of generations and pinches off. Now I think it's unknown in the fluid case if you could sort of in some if there is some low viscosity where you'll get just the self-submit cascade all the way down to zero size. But the interesting thing about this, this membrane paradigm, you say, well, what's the effect of viscosity of a, uh, a, a, black, a black hole? It's much, much smaller than any of these, these fluids. So the black hole is sort of sitting way up there. So you know, interesting, you know, this is not sort of quantitative, but it's sort of a qualitative similarity between Einstein and Nagy Stokes, even well into a nonlinear regime of this instability, which is quite surprising. And actually, also another interesting sort of thing is in Navier Stokes, when the when it pinches off, there's a known scaling relationship between the time to pinch off and the radius. And this is also what we see in the Einstein case. Okay, and so again, so that's, I think I don't know what the time is, but I'm pretty sure I'm close to running out. And the, the LHC stuff would take another 20, 30 minutes. So I'm going to skip that. My apologies if anyone's interested in that. Um, come and ask me afterwards. So let me just go to the conclusion. So hopefully I've been able to explain that the black holes are really interesting and perhaps startling predictions of, of Einstein's theory. Um, we actually think that they're out there. And despite everything that we've learned about them before, I think even just at the classical level, there's a lot of interesting science that's going to happen with black holes in the next couple of decades. The one main area is the gravitational wave um, Observatories that will hopefully look at the universe in gravitational waves. And one of the most promising sources is black hole collisions. But then also in this, in these other areas where, where you know, whether the string theory is right or not, but it seems that you know, in some sense black holes know more about fundamental physics than just about gravity. They seem to know about major stokes, perhaps even part of one plasma or super fluid. Um, and you know, it might just be that you know, perhaps if you go to higher dimensions, the, the kinds of solutions that you get to the field equations with horizons are so rich that you can just 
map them to whatever other processes you want. But it might be saying that there's something really deep there. There's some deep connection between fundamental physics and horizon. And I think that will hopefully become clear in the next few years as well. So thank you very much for your